Welcome everybody to a, I guess, holiday, somewhat holiday-themed episode of the Key Games Podcast here on Game Wisdom, where we're the art and science of games. It is a uh, Christmas Eve, and uh, nothing is stirring in the house but a couple of Joshes ready to talk about the video game industry. Josh, right. is, Josh has his exclusive <laughs> holiday headgear on there. Right, I actually got a good pool. Uh, from the guy, you know, so I got it. Finally got it. It took so many pulls, Josh. Mm-hmm. It took, I'm still uh, having to pull. I have to get to pity, I think. <laughs> but I hope everyone is having a great holiday, whatever you may celebrate. And hopefully you are staying warm. It went down to like 8 degrees here over last night. Right now we're up to a blistering 16 degrees outside. How is everything where you are? We are, we're 13 degrees, so nice and toasty. We're doing good. But we started the day off, it was like two days of zero degrees. So that was, that was interesting. Mm. Fun to throw the trash out. Oh, yes. It's fun to get like the mail when you open the door, like, the wind just blows you right back in. <laughs> the best. My wife's like, can you go check the mail? And it's like, yes, I will. <laughs> oh, it's bringing me back to when I was in college. And I had to like walk around the campus. It was like, 15 degrees with wind chill. And I had to wear like three coats, a scarf, a hat, gloves. I was in like full uh, winter survival mode. Right. <laughs> but it is great to see people on. And if you're watching this recorded, thanks for tuning in. So, uh, as a brief update, again, if you missed it, I've started my 2022 game review or uh, favorite games. Lots and lots of categories. And a star reminded me last night I had to do one for Vampire Survivor Likes. I wonder what game will win the Vampire Survivor Like award this year. I'm not quite sure. It's going to be, that's, that's going to be a tough pick, Joe. That's going to be the hardest pick of all of them, I think, right there. <laughs> no sleep for you. You're going to be tossing and turning, trying to figure it out. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> But uh, we have holiday sales going on. The Steam sale of so many games. I bought, I think I'm up to like four or five games I bought like IndieWise. Did you get anything from the sale so far? Unfortunately, I did not. I did not get any. I was, I've been too busy devving and had no time to look at any of the amazing sales. What'd you pick up, Josh? Uh, Let's see. I picked up uh, this dungeon crawler, Potato Flowers in Full Bloom, which is kind of interesting. Uh, the remaining uh, Dadish games, which are kind of like a platforming where you play a rash that's a dad, as the uh, name implies. Perfect. Uh, a shmup, another deck builder, and there's still a few more that I want to get as well, but we'll have to see. <laughs> I really like that dad radish. That's a great. <laughs> but other than that, I've been getting into heavy uh, book writing about RPGs. So I'm thinking for tomorrow, I'll probably play some more RPGs. I uh, got the uh, Ultima collection while I was on sale on GOG for like 5 $6, so I may really try and do an old-school play of at least looking at it. I don't think I will Is be Is it still finishing. on sale? Is it still on Could sale? I totally pick it up for 5 bucks for sure. Could be. I'm not quite sure. It was like the whole... Each one was like a dollar or something like oh, that. So. great. Definitely a lot of RPGing there, for sure. Yeah, that's a big RPG in. Mm-hmm. But I think with that, let us talk about 2022. As we said at the start, this is not going to be about our favorite games. That is going to be for next week's show, as we'll be ringing in 2023 with that. But definitely a lot of major trends and very interesting news beats that have happened this year. So, I guess for you, anything that you want to start off with? Um, I actually, you know, there's there's a few things, but one of the things I kind of want to mark, like, and we're talking about trends, is this year, I think, will go down as the first year that, like, we haven't done the AI talk yet, but mm-hmm. as far as AI being, like, fully, like, 100% in game dev now and available to, like most indie devs like this would be the pivotal year so if you could look back Mm -hmm. you could you we will be looking back at this year okay this is when ai modeling uh became prevalent this is when ai rigging when uh chat gp3 
um, and just, mm-hmm. you know, voice. And then, of course, the AI art, right? You know, recently just Art Station took down any, any AI, art, uh, AI art protests um, from there. And uh, if you don't know what Art Station is, it's one of the most prominent dev used uh, places for people to post, you know, art, game dev, uh, art, and stuff like that. And so it started becoming proliferated with AI art. And, of course, artists with carpal tunnel syndrome are not cool with that, you know, with AI generated mm-hmm. art. And so that was a big thing. But I guess just the long of story of it is that I believe that this year for sure, uh, that AI dev is this was the year that it really is starting to be emerged for sure, like as more commercially viable for uh, people to afford and also it's just free free options for everybody to use in indie game development space that's my main takeaway uh second i would say core gameplay loops totally rule still right mm-hmm. like it doesn't matter uh you know and that we we could vamp on vampire night on vampire survivors later or sometime but like that's just mm-hmm. a reminder that that a great core gameplay loop can be just as much as a juggernaut and still went out and like against triple a in every way like no matter how much money you throw at it you can't get a good core gameplay loop that's mm-hmm. the other thing um i you josh mm-hmm. i got plenty but mm-hmm. but uh yeah but i guess to add on what you're saying about ai art yeah it's only going to be a very i think tricky topic we still need to get sure. tomo on for that we need to get all of our schedules aligned but it is something that I think 2023 is going to be kind of, I think, the make it or break it year right. in terms yeah. of where it's going to fall in the industry, much like the other big topic, the whole kind of collapse and just utter uh, people loving the fact that a cryptocurrency had like a huge downward turn this year. And I remember writing the last book, I wrote in the, the free to play book that's I'm in Alia saying, oh yeah, crypto will either be like the most hot thing by the time this book comes out or will be completely dead. And right. it's looking like my <laughs> latter prediction may be coming true. And I think we had uh, NFT podcast toward the beginning of the year, right? Mm-hmm. And I think so far, how's that outlook looking? The NFT is about the same, following the same trend. Again, I have not really heard anything of it. Ramin is still working on his game. And like I said, that if anyone has the best chance to show off what like the whole NFT uh, play-to-earn kind of market could work, it's Robert, him. Yeah, yeah definitely. But he is definitely facing an uphill battle. Like He is doing, um, I guess, like Dark Souls times 5 game dev For right sure. now. For sure. I mean, like, just from the, you're going to have a big bash, backlash from just devs not liking mm-hmm. NFTs, normal NFT people not liking NFTs, and then just trying to prove that this is a concept that can work. Uh, I know, like, and we when we were discussing this, like, for sure, it is a viable way to do something, but it is, is it the best way, right? Like, it's a way that can work, yeah. but it, there's already other alternatives. So, if we could see something work properly, you know, I think for sure next year, like you said, will be the breakout year for, you know, we're going to see make it or break it for NFTs, for AI design, mm-hmm. stuff like that. Uh, definitely. Yep. And again, it's still very interesting to see like how it is all going to shake out. Um, it's again, like I wrote about this in the book that I felt like the early adopters, both of uh, AIR, NFTs, and that kind of thing, are suffering that same kind of issue as the early mobile games. That trying to turn into a slash and burn affair, you know, it's the next gold rush, we need to get in, make whatever the heck we want. And then all those games die because they're, at the end of the day, just not good games. And we saw this, there have been, people have like talked about a few of the NFT-related games released this year, and... I don't think any of them are making any game of the year list. Right. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, you know, when you were talking about, uh, uh, again, and like, we're, this is going to, like, this is going to happen next year for sure. There's going to be um, simple prediction. There's going to be a ton of vampire survivor likes. There's going to be a lot of open world card builder games. And for sure, there's going to be a lot of like AI generated games. Right. And, um, so we're we're gonna find out, you know, like everything from the art, from the programming, um, and we're gonna see how it shakes out. It's gonna be a very interesting time to see 
how it's utilized. And I know I, I've talked, we, we've, we've talked about this before, um, mm-hmm. you know, um, Hey pony. Um, we've talked about this before, you know, like where we are in the game industry, of course, we're still really, really early. Like, even though we're like 30 years in, this is still the infancy. Like we're still <laughs> creating the atomic particles to make the, you know, like I said, the tires and the steering wheels and everything. Um, so like there is like hope, right. That with AI that will take the menial tedious task away and like we can really focus on the important stuff. We're going to see if it works out that way. Uh, the side note, I got veered off, but the side note is that mm-hmm. there's like a massive, like, you know, people like there's so many derivative games. This is going to increase the derivative games. Regardless, the cream is always going to rise to the top. And there's right now the mobile market is flooded anyway. I don't know how it could possibly get any more <laughs> flooded. Right. It's it's like the noise level is going to reach like a stasis and then that's it. And so it's like, even if there's like more AI generated games or not, it's still going to, I think, be the same stasis. It's not going to be like this massive influx of more bad games. They'll be noted and we'll, we will, we will note them out. The blue found out, you know, cream rises to the top. So. Mm-hmm. And Hey Pony, we're kind of right now we're on the top of like AI art and the whole NFT thing kind of in flux at the moment. Yeah. And Again, I think for it's definitely that very weird position as someone who covers a lot of games with also developers. Because I know developers who have no artistic talent, who have right. they do not have the money to hire someone who can do art. And one of the things that we've seen, of course, is the very fact that games that don't have good art and good aesthetics, it's kind of like having one and a half feet in the grave when it comes to your game. So if someone could use a basic AI generator and give a game that little extra spice to it, that can go a long way. But again, on the other side of this, what about the artists, the people who make a living doing this stuff? Right. What happens to them if they can't get any work because even like at the most basic level, you know, an AI generator could put out stuff you know, it may not be at that same level, but it's that question of, do I give someone four or five hundred dollars per piece, or do I save four or five hundred dollars I can put towards something else? Exactly, exactly, and and you know, this is, um, it's it's really going to open up a lot of avenues, uh, for indie devs. Like like you said, Pony said, I have artistic talent, but I can't dev, and many devs can dev, but they don't have artistic talent, like you mm-hmm. said. And so, like, not even, like, not even using it in your game, for example, you can, like, what you could do is, like, if I was using the graphics generator and generating some art, right? And I could say, well, this is what I want to create. I want to create an evil demon chicken. Um, And so I put that in until I find one that I kind of like, and then I can take that and give it to a concept artist, or I could even take that and alter it, right? I could take that concept art and mm-hmm. put it in Photoshop and adapt it and work on it and not having to have the full basis of like 10 years of mastery of art to get to that level, right? To create that type of stuff. So there's two ways you can use it to like create art then then just alter it and change it mm-hmm. or present it to like a concept artist or stuff like that. Those are many things that you could do, you know? Yeah, just like Ikea. And again, the, the the thing is, is like one of the big problems right now in game dev, and this is what I, one of my big missions is to get out there, how the sauce is just made, how games are made so gamers can understand mm-hmm. uh, what is going on. And the thing is right now where we're still sitting at, for example, what I was programming today, I was programming a barrel explosion, right? So I've spent two days programming a barrel explosion and because it's a multiplayer game and it has to affect whether it affects the certain team member or depending on the game mode or there's various edge cases that you have to consider and just imagine like if like these types of facets were already done for you and programmed and so then we could focus instead on the good stuff which is the creative aspects and stuff like that so definitely um you know i can see it within like a few years where um, you will be typing in prompts for certain things. You know, I saw Mm -hmm. prompt prompt engineer pop up as a new term uh, for people who are, yeah, prompt engineer. Uh, So you enter in, okay, the, you know, chicken with whatever samurai pig or 
and in uh, in a realistic background and the prompt that you generate so there's like people actually arguing about well that's my prompt and trying to own copyright to the prompts mm. and so like you know uh losing my train of thought here but 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 basically um it will allow any i need a prompt engineer yes yeah mm. uh, <laughs> Um, but basically, it'll just open up the avenues for indie games to create art, 3D modeling, uh, music, and all kind of other things. But it has to be used correctly. And of course, we talked about it in our last uh, podcast, which you can check out, about repurposing and using assets correctly. And uh, definitely, mm -hmm. uh, you can go with that. Yep. And again, I, as I said, when it comes to like mobile design and stuff like that, that all this stuff is really just tools. And how yep. they are used and implemented is determines, you know, whether they're good, bad, or indifferent. And, again, there are developers out there who could really use, even at the most, like, the most basic of the basic AI art generators, could elevate their game up this much. Because, right. again, like, how many student games, how many first-time or even smaller indie games that I've played that they don't have good art because again they're not they're a programmer and they're a designer but they're not like a full-time artist they don't have 10 15 years of experience but again it then raises that question of as you just said what if someone can just go around just like patent every yeah exactly pony developer i've heard that term a whole lot programmer art is programmer the one art. that i hear a lot yeah programmer but what about if someone just says, you know, I'm going to try and copyright any AI art that starts with uh, monkey. You know, anything that is right. monkey art is mine and you cannot trademark it. And it's that, again, we're in that very weird period when it comes to ownership. We've seen this with digital games. We've seen this with, you know, songs and so on when they went online. And it's very again, very murky to navigate at this moment because no one wants to set that precedent of, okay, this is okay, but this is not. And right now, we're now hearing about the comic book industry that right. will, may really stamp down on any kind of AI-driven or AI-generated art for a comic book. Um, uh, what about people who do, I saw about children's uh, authors, you know, if someone can just generate a children's book in an hour, and, yeah. like, what's the purpose, like, does it actually do anything worthwhile? Again, that's that brings us back to this question. The people who are going to use AI art for a video game, are they doing it because they have a really great idea and they're just lacking the art? Or are they just doing that to pump out some super cheap game for a two ninety nine, right. and hope that they can sucker, you know, five ten people, and it would still make that money back. Right, definitely. I mean, and that's 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 the clutch, right? I mean, um, for sure. If you're if you're coming at this, and you're going to be using AI art, that is because it is something that you're lacking in. You need, I need help with audio. I need help with character rigging. I cannot afford to to pay a professional rigger. I cannot afford to mm -hmm. pay a professional 3D modeler. So I'm going to use this to up my game up 20 mm -hmm. points, right, in graphics. Of course, we're going to get a ton. We're going to get a big influx of those people that are going to be cash and grabbing with the AI just generating games and comic books and we're going to see mm -hmm. it music and it, it's going to be it's going to be wild i don't i don't know how we're going to be able to curate it because we've already we already have curation issues right like it's already mm -hmm. like we're already maxed out on how how can we curate steam how do we do this and so it's gonna it's definitely going to get worse in 2023 uh, pony had a question about um uh game devs who've mastered multiple fields um the the thing about mastering multiple fields is that for one you can't really master like a field because they're always evolving and changing and mm -hmm. then you can you can only master so many because you only have so much time in the day right so like mm -hmm. me for example um you know like c++ or blueprints um there's there's certain things that i focus on and then there's some things that i can't focus on so much so maybe for example i can't focus on art for example because i did not study art so there's no way that i can 
focus that amount of time to create and generate quality art that would even look like even okay in my game right so of course i would need to outsource it to someone else or of course ai generator but yeah masters in the field um and everything is very rare someone who understands mm -hmm. like the tooling and the pipeline and the way that everything works way more common studio leads and everything like that they understand pretty much every aspect of how things work like i could explain pretty much every aspect of like game dev what's required for this what's required for this to get the game together uh but as far as like getting into it and like rigging the character myself or rigging up the audio of course that would require someone with a master you know who's been doing it forever mm -hmm. let's see and uh you can tell i'm not an ai because an ai wouldn't play so many masochistic games i think that yeah. answers that <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Sometimes, sometimes I, I I see the game you're playing, Josh, and I'm like, Josh, how are you doing it? How do you mm -hmm. do it, Josh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, let's see. Is there anything else about AI or an NFT, or should we move on to the? Uh... Yeah, let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and move on. Let's okay. go ahead and move on. So I guess one of the big things that I guess one of the big trends going back to what uh, Josh was talking about quality rising up this has been another i think very stellar year for the independent space yeah, despite big. what streamers and uh, reviewers may think that there aren't any good games to play i think this year i probably played more video games than anyone else if if you were to like take like just watch the game awards your takeaway would literally be like there was like two three games released this year right like mm -hmm. you would you wouldn't even think there but there was a massive amount of games josh like and I, you're the one that that would be talking about all the games that were released um but i i do have this i do have a feeling about 2022 uh up feeling mediocre but i just definitely think that the triple a space is just i don't know either i'm just I know you've been turned off for it for a while, and so have I, but mm -hmm. it just seemed like way, 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 way more um, capitalistic and just not, it just didn't seem to be like living up to the previous years. And indie really stepped up, like you said, like this was definitely a breakout year for indie games. Um, mm -hmm. and, I, and I felt like if you were into indie games, this was definitely a good year for you. And uh, I think it def I noticed a, a big uptick and like um in in twitter and people just like being more into indie games uh than triple a people being tired of the same formula in triple a and, and realizing that if you want to play something different you go to the indie space because literally everything is a little bit different mm -hmm. and with a lot of the indie games that we've had a chance to play it was kind of interesting just to see again like where the trends have been going again the biggest one was, of course, Vampire Survivors. And it is, again, that kind of funny thing, but you just can never really predict what is going to be that gameplay loop that everyone's going to fall in love with. And it is, I think, a really good example, again, of really how much the packaging surrounding a game can matter. Or, you know the aesthetic and that, that kind of charm to it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the look, the charm of that game, but again, the, 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 the core gameplay loop, like I really haven't been like sucked into a game like, so like that. Uh, and quite a while, I haven't felt something so unique when I was playing it, you know, uh, in a long time, but for sure. Um, Mm -hmm. and again it's going to be interesting when we see everyone try and kind of copy that design or have been trying to copy that design and again it really i think showcases to me just how important understanding design is and like one of my first posts i already have planned for 2023 is going to be talking about the difference between analyzing a game and reviewing a game because i think a lot of people looked at vampire survivors and they took the wrong lessons with the vast vast many clones and kind of lesser examples and like you said there have been some really good standout games that have kind of elevated that design but trying to explain to someone why this vampire survivor like is better than this vampire survivor like is a lot harder 
It definitely, Josh. <laughs> but we'll have to see where that one uh, stands out. Now, I guess another thing about indies and going back to the Game Awards, I have to get your thoughts and everyone on, you know, the AAA indie developer. And what the heck does that mean for the industry? Um, not good things. Um, it's like the, the deglutation of the indie space by giant corporations, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and, and kind of like, and I'm, I'm probably going to get into tangent here about like the purity of indie games and, and stuff like that. And then when you take them and you're instead now being published by, I don't know, Bethesda, and you have all this massive money, you're no longer, right, an indie at all in any way. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe we need to, like, uh, redefine, is that super giant? We need to redefine what uh, mm -hmm. an indie is, or maybe put, we, we need to put down the definitions, Josh, so that way people mm -hmm. can say, okay, that's it, we need to refer to the game wisdom definition of what an indie <laughs> game developer is, because uh, th that's, that's, that's blurring the lines, and then the consumer is like, "Oh wow!" And uh, what, what, what was it, the phrase again? Now I can't even remember. Uh, it. Triple A indie, triple A indie, right? And so that makes absolutely no sense. It's it's clearly a triple A game. It's it's it was or a indie game purchased by a triple A studio. Josh, what are your thoughts on it? Mm. So terms, <laughs> yeah. Uh Again, it's that very tough line. I think this goes back to one of the points. Like when the indie side started to kind of grow in the 2010s, I remember this sentiment that people were looking at indie as being the kind of career stepping stone in the triple Right. That right. you would go out college. You would make a cute little indie game. Then you would go into a triple A company and you would never make an indie game again. Like, indie was viewed as not the end goal of your career. It was viewed as, you know, step two, step three. But what we've seen is that, no, like, you can be an indie developer and you can put out amazing quality games all from the comfort of your own home, your own studio. You could care less about what Nintendo or Activision or Valve or any major <laughs> company is doing right now. And I should play that little that game where you use pizza to save the day as we're talking about pizza in chat. <laughs> but again, it's that idea that at some point you can make the it, being an indie developer can pay out big it can be your profession it can be your career it's not again just oh you're going to just stop you know at some point you make enough indie games and then you get hired by nintendo and then you close your company because the funny thing is that we've seen developers who got picked up by AAA, like indie went to AAA, a who yeah. then decide you know what i'm going right back to indie right back um, right back what was his name? Uh, Tim Keenan, who did Duskers. I know, I think he got a job at, I forget what studio, but now he's back to making indie games. Um, oh, no. Uh, Zach Barth. Again, like, his thing, uh, the whole, his like, career arc this year has just been very weird to watch. He said, I'm quitting video games forever. I'm going to go into teaching. Okay, I hate teaching. I'm going back into video games. I'm not making another programming game. Okay, I'm making a programming okay, program game. game. Very soon, I will convince him to make that factorial. Like, don't you worry, I will do it. <laughs> yeah, man, and and uh, that's that's the thing. Yeah, like a long time ago, you know, it was like okay, release an indie game, release something until I get noticed, and then I can go into the AAA space or something like that. Now. I don't really know, and this is just me personally in my circle. I don't know anyone who is trying to go into the AAA space. Yeah. Um, the the thing is, like you were saying, Josh, to your point. I mean, we can actually make a living from this now, from the comfort of our home. There's so many ways that you can um, earn income, right? You can stream, mm -hmm. 
create the video game, make Patreons, do all kind of things and release the game, release quality games, year, mini games, quality years, and like not be beholden to like a giant corporation because I'm sure many of those indie devs realize, oh wait, this is no longer like I'm beholden to, to stakeholders mm-hmm. now and, and this is all about how much money we can extract. It's no longer about the game exactly anymore and so like of course they'd run screen back to where we're just making the video game and that we're just making games for people to enjoy and also you can make a living off of it and yeah i mean again just i i don't i, I don't know anyone personally who is running to the triple a space because you can do it in the indie space and you mm-hmm. and and we can all work from home we can do it through discord we can do it through slack uh, we mm-hmm. can, you know, you could, you could do everything remotely and, um, you know, so there's, there's no reason to, uh, uh to do that. Mm-hmm. And I think, again, it goes back to this point of what do you call a mega successful indie developer? Because again, indie can mean a one person operation making little games it can also mean Red Hook Studios, Super <laughs> Thank you, Pony. Uh, Super Giant Games. It can mean uh, what was that? Uh, whoever does PUBG. Like, it can mean a lot of different developers in there. But again, it's that question of: uh, Do you stop being an indie dev at some point? Is you know, do you grow out of it? Or do you just, you know, I guess level up or do you become a more prominent example of this? Because again, there are developers like um, Dave Gilbert, a Wadget Eye, Jeff Vogue of Spireweb Software, who've been doing this now for, I think combined, they're like 40, 50 years of yeah. being in the industry. They're not household names. I did not see, despite how much praise Wadget Eye has gotten, how much of a cornerstone they are of the adventure game market i didn't see any adventure game noms from them from the game awards very right. few people talk about outside their circles the same goes for jeff i still haven't played a queen's wish too yet and i still want to get to that one but again it's that point of do you i guess grow out being an indie dev or do we need like a new term like maybe long term indie, sustainable indie. I don't know. Yeah, something like that, definitely. Because I mean, eventually, right? You're indie, and uh, uh, eventually, if you continue long enough and you're sustainable, then you'd be like a sustainable indie or or profitable mm-hmm. indie, lucky <laughs> indie, something like that. Super indie, ex. I mean, um. But yeah, like eventually you do, you will grow out of it if you continue and you don't stop and you and you progress forward in some way. Then yeah, you you will grow out of it to, let's just say, sustainable indie. Then super indie ex <laughs> from Chad, yeah. And again, like there, I don't know. I see this I see sometimes on Twitter or game dev spaces where people will argue about. I guess how big or how good a developer was. Like one of the pieces I saw people were complaining about was the idea of a solo dev. Yeah. And this was something that I saw people like talking about with like Stardew Valley. And I don't know, like part of it I feel may be coming from a place of jealousy. Like it just seems like sometimes like people who argue about this will kind of like try and put as many holes into it. Or What's the that argument? What's the argument? I think it was the fact that he um, was helped by his girlfriend or wife at the time. So he wasn't, he, so he wasn't solo, right? Yeah. Uh, they, were, they weren't considering him solo because he was helped by someone. I mean, yeah. then... Yeah, go ahead, Josh. Yeah, no, I'll <laughs> finish your thought. I mean, see, the thing is, is that is like when a solo dev is like... You are a solo dev, right? If you're the one doing like mostly everything, but you can you're just because you get help. Like maybe if I got if I purchase marketplace assets, am I no longer a solo mm-hmm. dev? 
uh, if my wife helps me with the taxes, am I no longer a solo dev? Like you, you, you will need help in certain other avenues, mm -hmm. but you're probably doing like 99.9% .9 of everything if you were a solo dev. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's just the way it is. If you are not, if you have like another, if it's you and then another programmer who's like programming, then you are no longer like a solo dev. But if you were doing all the programming, you're doing all the art, all the sound, all mm -hmm. that, I mean, you're the solo dev. But like, um, I, I don't, I don't know like how hardcore you'd want to be about that selective term about being a solo dev, you know, yeah. it's, it's like, that's a big extreme. Yeah. And it, it also, I think goes back like about this whole conversation of what is an indie? Because there yeah. are people who I think still like the person who was saying it was like I don't believe there's anything there's no such thing as an in, a solo dev. And I'm just sitting here playing literal games from one yeah. man one, or one. one person at teams, and yet yeah, there are solo devs. Do they blow up to be you know the next stray? Probably not. But even if they did, I still feel there'll be people who'll be trying to take that game down in some way, shape, or form. Again, it goes back, I think, like, to the whole Elden Ring. You know, the whole, like, game devs who couldn't understand why people were playing Elden Ring. And it's still, again, that issue, I think, when it comes to understanding, I think, the work, like, to what you were saying earlier about how the sausage game has been made. That there are developers who do... You know, ninety to ninety-five percent of the work, and then they may outsource music, yep. or they may bring in someone for QA testing. And that's another point: Are you a solo dev if you have a if you get play testers? Right. Are you a solo dev if you use Unity? Remember, like, there's the argument about oh, you can't you be doing all yourself if you use a, a public engine. That's right. That one drove me nuts. That one drives <laughs> you have to make your engine from scratch, otherwise you're not. It's insane. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, you need to you need to use the tools the the tools that we were saying they're just tools for you to get the product out to the consumers as mm -hmm. quick as possible, or as 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 efficient as possible, so you can focus on the more important tasks, which isn't usually figuring out how like shaders are computated or like mm -hmm. garbage collection or memory allocation mm -hmm. because gamers don't care about that right like video mm -hmm. gamers don't care they'll know it doesn't run right but they don't know it's because you didn't know how to code memory allocation right they won't know why your net code runs bad i um, understand why there's they don't know what memory leak is <laughs> right or why or why your options menu doesn't work or why the volume sliders aren't there Right, they won't say. Oh, clearly he had the Z order out, and and I. Oh, I remember he didn't run this one function. That's why the menu's not working. No problem. They don't. It's broken. It doesn't matter. They don't care. Right. That would break uh, like a developer's mind. They get like a review. This stupid developer didn't figure out how the physics work, and you have to use this function instead of this function. Oh, now I'm gonna get some of those on Samurai Pig. We'll see. <laughs> That and, would that would blow my mind. I love it. Someone's got to do it. Pony, do it. <laughs> Damn it, dumb developer doesn't understand how physics work. He uses this <laughs> formula, and that has to be programmed like this. <laughs> just have like a developer just write the entire review, like with all code logic into it, and then just say, "Well, it'll be fixed now." Just it'll be fixed now. Here's your fix. <laughs> And again, like to the point about like this idea of a triple A indie, like it definitely feels like a lot. <laughs> I think you just uh, uh, coded Elden Ring there, Pony. Elden Ring. <laughs> it again goes to this idea, and I think even to other developers, something that I say a lot that a lot of people do not understand what goes into a successful game. Or why a game is successful. And there are developers who I feel that they'll look at a popular game or a game that did blow up. And their first thought is to try and take it down. And I think I'm hearing some feedback. I'm not sure if it's from your microphone or your headset. Is it mine? Uh -huh. So like hearing like a little bit of it. Hmm. We'll see if it, if it keeps coming. But... Wait, I think my AC is running. 
I don't think so. Hmm. Weird. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, but, but to the point, like, that there is this tendency I feel that people will look at a very popular game and their first thought is, well, it wasn't that good. Cool. You know, what did they do that I didn't do? You know, they must have either cheated or they're not they're not as good as people say they are. And again, it's that issue of being able to analyze a game because conversely, no game is perfect. Every game on my game of the year list, I can probably point out a few flaws with it. But it's about understanding what that game did right. What did it do with its design that's more important? And if you're just sitting here trying to pick apart a game saying, oh, it you know, it succeeded just because this guy lied about being a solo dev, or it succeeded because this guy just, you know, they got very good PR people, or whatever, it just doesn't, I think, work for me. No, and I mean, and, and like we were saying about, you know, the cream rises, you, to the top, you can't, I mean, okay, the, the, if if maybe they had a good marketing campaign, and maybe... Okay, maybe they they said, okay, I'm a solo dev or this and that, and they lied about this or they did that. Still, regardless, the game is the game and people are going to play the game. And if the game is no good and it doesn't hold up, you know what I mean? Uh, it, it might got, get it a few sales, but eventually it's going to be found out that the game was based on a lie or it's not very good. So, yeah, it, that doesn't hold up for me either, Josh. Mm-hmm. And again, I think it's also that point of people really trying to prop up the games that they personally like over anything else. Going back to Elden Ring, it's that idea of, well, how do all these people love this hard game like Elden Ring and they love this, you know, emotionally driven game like The Last of Us 2 or Horizon Zero Dawn or God of War? And to your point, again, it's about understanding what makes a game work and what makes it not work. And gamers will gravitate towards games. It could also be that push and pull between the consumer side and the critic side. A critic can love a game like uh, Immortality or Pentiment that came out, or Penitent or Pentiment, be a, a renaissance looking game that came out last month. But if the consumer, if it has like an 80% churn rate, or people are quitting within 30 minutes, it doesn't matter how much you love the game or how many awards it wins. And this is something that we've said before. If you look at store pages of a lot of indie games, they'll have on the right-hand side, you know, best indie game of 2018, best breakout star 2019, you know, most innovative idea, and it gets, like, 30 reviews on Steam. All right. I, 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 uh, uh, years ago, I was like, oh man, I wish I could get those awards. And then mm -hmm. I, I found out that they don't really do anything right. It's like mm -hmm. ha having, having those, those awards on your page, it doesn't mean anything and literally doesn't mean anything to anybody, right? Like mm -hmm. if you're, you're looking at it and you say, okay, you're looking at the game and you say, okay, well, got an award for this and it got a, that just means it like we've talked about, like we were talking about the award show in the previous one, like how did they get into the awards? How did they have, was it through marketing? Was it through money? Was it paid off? Right. It's like, we're not sure how it even, how the award was even awarded. Like, and uh, so it doesn't really leave, give any credence to the game. And usually those games that are like that, that run like the bat, they get all these awards. Mm -hmm. Um, they don't really get that many reviews. They don't really do that good because eventually it's found out, you know, that it's just it's just based on uh, 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 maybe not good gameplay, a lie, just good, really good marketing, PR, etc. Mm -hmm. And again, it's the idea that just because you like something doesn't mean it's a great game. Just, and conversely, if you hate something, doesn't mean that is a bad game. Exactly, and I mean, you could, I'm sure you have some, some bad games that you like that you're like, mm -hmm. I like this bad game, right? It's just, there's yeah. certain bad games that you might like and certain good games that you might not like. It's just it, but it doesn't, that's simply your opinion though. Mm -hmm. uh, breaking down what's actually going on in the game and understanding what's good and bad about it is what we need to get to the core of instead. Yeah. And uh, that's what we were talking about, taking out your, 
your opinions on the game and instead really breaking it down well how does how does the platforming feel is it floaty um Mm -hmm. was there were the collectibles just in random places that didn't seem to make sense it seemed like they were ai generated or uh you know just various things that you should be analyzing about the game instead of like your inner feelings yeah and to that point, I saw a, uh, I won't name them on Twitter, but a very recognizable developer was talking about Somerville. And they were saying, I don't understand why people aren't liking this game. You know, it looks beautiful, and I just love how it plays. And it's like, what, what is wrong with this game? Why is no one enjoying it? And I'm just, I, I was resisting that urge to bring yeah. up the UI issues and sure. all that. And again, like I'm looking at it on Steam, and again, within 30 minutes, it lost 60% of its player base in terms of people who went into it. Where I stopped playing it, it was at 16.9% of the uh, Steam achievements. So that is 84% of the people who played Somerville did not get past an hour of that game. Did you get, you got, you said you got to that laser part? Yeah, like a rock, a a concert that you had to like uh, manipulate like a lighting and so on. Okay, okay. All right, so you got further than me, yeah. And again, that's my uh, AI-driven masochism at work there. But again, it's that point of, and I'm, we may be bringing this back up in 2023 as well, but it's that point that, being able to understand the quality of a game is something that it's very hard to put into words. You can say your favorite game is X, but if you can't say why, you know, what X did right and what it did wrong, then that's not really an analysis. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, um, why was The Last of Us good? Why was Vampire Survivors oh. good? You are a sound one now, like you're. You also like got like really quiet. Okay. Oh, there you go. There's a. There, okay. I don't know why I'm having sound issues today. Maybe it's the weather related. I don't know. Yeah. Could be. Yeah. But again, it's ideal. So, to bring this back to the point, then we'll move on to another uh, topic. Like with someone like Super Giant, like Super Giant Games didn't you know sell out. They didn't you know grow outside the indie space. They've just put out really damn good indie games and one really good game lets people notice the other really good game they've done and they are again like one of the quintessential like top tier indie studios people like clay entertainment i think would probably fall there as well with uh, auction not included and don't starve and would super giant be considered i mean a triple a like independent is that what like we were we like okay so regular indie like your first indie you're just an indie and then you're a double a indie <laughs> if maybe you got some cells and mm-hmm. then you're triple a when you're super giant <laughs> maybe we just call you super giant indies from now oh, on super giant indie that's what we'll do super giant indie super giant indie ex and i'm going to make a prediction that when Hades 2 comes out and it does oh well gosh. and all that, oh there will be people who will complain and then say, you know, well, wh- you know, they're not really indie anymore. Why are we calling, you know, a super giant game an indie game anymore? They have all this prestige and all this clout. And again, prestige and clout is something that it does separate a lot of indie developers out there. Again, we've seen, we know plenty of indie teams who would kill for 100 reviews on Steam, who would kill to have a YouTuber cover their game. And then you have any studios who, they don't have to do a damn thing. People come to them. Dwarf Fortress is a really good example of this. Like, no one needs to, you know, beg uh, Zach and Torn to cover their game. They don't need to do any kind of you know, spiel or marketing push for Dwarf Fortress. It is a, that big of a game, just like Vampire Survivors is that big of a game now. But at, do you grow out being an indie developer? Like, at some point, do we just say you're a double-A studio or, you know, 
double A indie or like do we go maybe it's like you start as like a D indie then you go C B uh C D B A and then you go double D or no double A and then double A A B A C A D and then you go triple A and it just keeps adding letters S, S and then S plus um, and I'm then U R at- and then L R and then S S R indie. I'm looking at the amount of team members in Supergiant, and it's like 20, it looks like about 20-ish people uh, Mm -hmm. that they have on their studio. So we could be considering, like, the size of the studio, like, the amount of people they have working right, for sure, as one of the things. Because, like, I'm just seeing they literally just have, like, one, uh, you know, Darren Korb is music and audio. um, one system engineers guy. Uh, so, I mean, I suppose that would be one metric. We could probably go by, you know, how many people are actually on the team. Because once you get past, like, I mean, <clears throat> I'd say, like, like, like you could get a double A, oh, my gosh, double A indie game with, like, four people. And then, like, triple A would be, like, 20 people, right? So it's, like, like zero to zero to five zero to ten that'd be your low in the or solo mm-hmm. right and then mid-tier would be 10 to 15 and then above right I, I think you'd have to stop at 20 or 30 if you get past that then you're really getting too far maybe some we could go with something like that Mm-hmm. but again it's a case of we have seen phenomenal games come from five people or less people, teams yeah yeah. Again, like, do we call Vampire Survivors now an indie dev? You know, when they're when the game, do we? What about number of reviews? Like, if you go over a hundred thousand reviews, are you no longer an indie developer anymore? Again, it's that very weird point about you know either trying to prop someone up, saying, "Oh, look at what they did as just two people in a shed and they made a game." Versus, oh, these people, they sold out. They have 20 people on their team now. Like, once you, if you're 19 and under, you're good. 20 to 25, you sell out. And then 26 to 30, you're just Activision. I think so. I think so. Uh, okay, so I'm looking at the Wikipedia uh, definition. So the Wikipedia definition is an indie game typically created by individuals or smaller development teams without the financial and technical support of a large game publisher. So, uh, but then what about Devolver? Like, there are people already about Devolver, Devolver yeah, now. Is yeah. Devolver a indie publisher now? You know, they had their own yearly expo. Like, when you, if you have your own year uh, game expo, are expo. you an indie? <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, I don't think so, Josh. 2023 Game Wisdom Expo is coming. We'll get uh, shirts printed. Uh, we'll start selling tickets for it. <laughs> okay, and then and then it has an addendum. It says, however, the indie term may apply to other scenarios where the development of the game has some measure of independence from a publisher, even if the publisher helps fund and distribute a game. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, but it, again, it's going to be that discussion and. To bring this back to AI art and like AI driven stuff, I can't wait for the conversation around a solo developer who used an AI art yep. and made a breakthrough game. That is going right. to send game dev Twitter like Hindenburg happen. crashing. It is going to happen, like guaranteed, guaranteed. Next, uh, I don't know. Maybe next year we'll see. But I mean, because like I was saying at the beginning of the podcast, this year was the year that all the tools were made available to us. So next year, uh, we're going to be seeing them really come out. I think there was like one or two AI. How many AI games did you know? I, I noted there was a few on Steam, uh, but not a ton. I'm getting some crazy feedback, aren't I? Uh, uh, the only AI driven art I have not seen. Oh, uh, wait. I did see one game uh, when I spoke with Brian Cronin. He was making like a idle kind of a idle management game that used all AI driven art for it. And again, it like for something like that when you don't like here's the other point. I was just saying about this with roguelikes. Roguelikes for the longest time use ASCII. 
because if you're building a procedurally generated game, you can't really code or you can't really design handmade aesthetics around a game built on proc gen. Like imagine if there was an AI art uh, program or AI algorithm for roguelikes 15, yeah. 20 years ago. How yeah. much would that have done to that genre? Yeah, well, it, 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 I think within, I'm going to make us like a, I, I feel like within two to three years, the, the pipeline between like, we will be able to like generate AI, AI art, like at runtime in the game, uh, probably sooner than that. So I feel like uh, roguelikes will really be, of course, will be able to benefit from that hugely. But I mean, like any game, I, I, if you can imagine the possibilities of being able to generate an asset at runtime, um, that's like a lot of dynamic playability that you could introduce to the game. Um, mm -hmm. But I feel like I feel like that's that's very close because we're already we already can like prop generate. 3D mm -hmm. models. So if you could use like you could use like an a uh, uh, chat, you could use like whatever like a, a text generator to generate the 3D model mm -hmm. or however you want to do it. But I could see that happening very soon, and uh, for sure next year, I'm sure somebody next year is going to be the first AI uh, breakout game, and we're going to find out. I mean, and then what I'm wondering about a side point is we were you brought up the comic books earlier, Josh. Uh, that there's one comic book that it applied for copyright, mm -hmm. and now the copyright is being removed from it, so it will not have copyright protection on this AI generated comic book. So, what is the copyright going to be for a video game, right? If you mm -hmm. use AI generated art, we haven't even opened up that wormhole yet. So, what if you use AI generation to create a mascot character or to create right. a brand character? Can you say that you own trademark on something that was created by an AI uh, program? Yeah. yeah, and see, and see, the thing is, is that like if 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 you're messing with the AI, the like art generators, you'll actually see like people's signatures show up in the picture that it generates because what it's doing is it's parsing like all these people's mm -hmm. artwork and then it's putting mashing it together and so you can literally like get something done and there'll be two different people's signatures on your art when that you generated it and i generated it, i was like oh my gosh that's a person's i and i looked them up on art station and it was there and i i, I, mm -hmm. I mean like insane so um yeah the the what is the usability like what is going to be the law for that and and in the in the copyright because that's a huge issue we already have that issue right now i mean mm -hmm. like uh i don't know if we're going to get to it or not but like all the games that died this year and many of the reasons that they died other than you know like poor support and management sometimes was just because of the copyright of like some of the songs or copyright of some of the issues and things and so those things run mm -hmm. out too so just another thing to keep in mind yeah, and it does, I think, also have an impact on games that are built on, like, um, editing software. You know, stuff mm -hmm. like Mario Maker, um, what was it, uh, RPG Maker, like, anything like that. Like, can someone use RP? Like, again, how many RPG Maker-based games have gone on to become full commercial products? What if someone says, well, if you use a uh, something like RPG Maker, it's not considered a prog game or it doesn't have protection. Yeah, very true, Josh. I, I don't know. And, and again, that is definitely something too big to get into. We're almost an hour in right now, but that's something I definitely want to talk with Tomo more about when we can get him on and see what definitely. he Definitely. That'll be a good one. That'll probably be like a three-hour... <laughs> <laughs> so... In terms of other trends this year, we've okay. talked about games, we talked about AI, um, well, we can of course talk about Diablo, and even just like how more mobile elements are being brought into retail games. Oh, what was the game that just came out that had $60 and then they also wanted DLC? I forget which one it was. Was it the Callisto Protocol? Am I thinking of another game? Callisto Protocol, wasn't it? Yeah, but I know there was something else that people were arguing that oh, um, Arkham Knights also had issues as well. Um, but we've definitely been seeing, of course, with Diablo Immortal, 
I think one of the bigger trends, actually this I think is a really good one, has definitely been this all out of Blizzard. Like it's been like kind of slow descent over the last three to four years. Yeah. This year seemed to be kind of like, you know, the meteor slamming down. This was the year I think I, I even forgot about this. This was a year of all the lawsuits that came right. out about Blizzard. The this year. Strikes at Activision. Uh just the uh, sheer you know, people hating Diablo Immortal, um, Overwatch 2, Two. anything else, like, Blizzard-related? Uh, I, I think that's, that probably sums it up, um, yeah, a ton of Blizzard, like, this was definitely the downfall year of Blizzard, for sure, it's been on a slow decline, like you said, but mm -hmm. this year, for sure, was just so bad for them, um, mm -hmm. Another thing, though, when you mentioned Diablo Immortal, another thing that kind of I was a little taken aback about how little pushback there was from the consumers on on mm -hmm. it. I felt I felt like um, I don't know, maybe it was just the marketing campaigns around streamers and and YouTubers, but it felt like um, there just wasn't enough pushback against that type of monetization. Like people just have given up, and they're just like, "This is the way it is now." And I just remember the game Dark Tide, the one that we Dark Tide, played. Dark Tide, a sixty dollar game that also features dailies, weeklies, premium currencies, and yeah. And I picked up. I've been playing a few more mobile games. So there is one I play, Path to Nowhere, which is basically Ark Knights but grittier somehow, and. That one again, it has a whole lot of that mobile. Oh, I love that they have the gotcha, and you have a pity of, you guys pull 80 times, and then if you don't get the better character, you pull another 80 times, and you're guaranteed. So it's 160 pulls of a premium currency to get that character. And I could, like, rant and rave about that kind of stuff, but it does represent, I think, not just with game with Path of Nowhere, but Ark Knights, Ezra Lane, Genshin, and so on, that a lot of these systems and elements that we've been, you know, rallying against over the past decade have become the norm for a lot of people. It's the idea that, well, wait, you're releasing this game and you don't allow me to spend nineteen ninety five for bonus resources? What the heck is wrong with you? Yeah. Your game doesn't feature you know, weekly grinds and dailies and all that, then, you know, it's a dead game. And the whole, like, live service-ness has really, I think, pervaded into the AAA side. Yeah, man. And uh, 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 like you said, pervading into the AAA side, it's probably one of the reasons why I've been so averse to AAA as of recently is, is just because that is just so endemic everywhere. Like, I... And, and and again, I'm just gonna just repeat this that I, I can't believe that there's it's almost it's almost like the, we've that the the current gamer crop has been raised on this, and so it's just normalized now, or 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 we just rolled over and just as accepted it because I felt I felt like maybe like ten years ago or fifteen years ago, people were like, no way am I paying for the game and paying for what is DL what. No way. Now I'm. Uh, I'm not. Uh, and now again, it's like you don't have deals. You don't have day one. Uh, there's. There's no gotcha. Like what? Is this isn't a game. <laughs> uh, I feel like it's. It's turned. Have we all forgotten when people had a ride over two ninety nine horse armor? Horse armor. The horse armor just, man. Yeah. I'm just sitting here. The the horror just washed over me. When they do, like, Elder Scrolls, what are we up to? We're up to five right now, right? Yes, so yes. So, when they do Elder Scrolls six, because you know it's going to come, right? Again, like, yeah. a new Elder Scrolls game is, like, arguing if there's going to be a new Mario game. For real. Are they going to do horse armor and have, like, loot boxes and all that? They're going to do it 100%. They're going to do the horse armor, and they're going to, like, it's going to be, like, triple the price just... Like of uh, the the first one was like two ninety nine, so this one's be like sixteen ninety nine. And how many people will complain about it now? Look at like Call of Duty. You have the loot boxes and systems in that one. 
Um, like going back with like Gotham Knights, it's a game, and like to that point about kind of like live service stuff and those elements seeping in, we've seen that kind of very much that uh, uh, smoothing down the rough edges. So this is something I was talking with another Josh. I did a podcast week uh, podcast with this week earlier when we were talking about open world RPGs that. A lot of AAA games are making use of the same mechanics and the same systems. And it just comes off as feeling very, I guess, fate in terms of like the quality of these games. Yeah, definitely. 100%. And uh, not only fake, but just copy pasta. Like, um, I mean, you know, like if I played another Ubisoft style game again, like, uh, I, I don't I don't think I could handle that, you know, Josh. <laughs> hmm But yeah, um, uh, definitely. And I'm trying to look up uh how Gotham Knights is doing right now. Let's see. It is down. It is now mostly positive. It is already on sale for thirty dollars. Didn't it just come out for sixty like a month ago? Maybe yes. a little bit more than that. Oh wait, I can yes. look at the release day, October twenty first. So just un just over two months and it's already half off. So I mean that is definitely something right there. And definitely a time. And again, it's that point of you can say that these systems bring in money, but how much are you kind of burning through the goodwill of your player base? If we right. look at Gotham Knights, it goes from 91%, which I assume is like your opening achievement, to 68%. So that that is a pretty big spike in terms of people not playing that game. And even if the game does do well, even if it does end up being a positive game, how many people are going to want to check out the next game from this? I don't know. No, no. Not, not like again burning that goodwill you know i mean you can only do it so much you know what i mean mm-hmm. and you you, you can all, you can only reach into people's pockets so much mm-hmm. and without good gameplay or without a, but but anyway like the main the main thing is like this type of like uh capitalism in gaming just i understand we understand it's a business but like especially with life services there has to be a better way um a more sustainable way that doesn't that doesn't rip off the player and doesn't like uh i'm trying to think of the word here josh um mm. uh, victimize i don't know but just but, but just where where they're, they're we're literally psychologically uh Force again, we we accept it, right? It's like you don't have gotchas. It's not a game. Like people's minds are already t- warped to the way to accept that that these are how games work, but it's not how it should be. Like mm-hmm. there should be a better. I think if it's a live service, why not have a subscription? Of course, it would be because it doesn't make as much money as as when you would have a whale that spends so much and they buy every pool and mm-hmm. this and that. But if you're talking about economics and quality and then wanting to have a sustainable, like, like mm-hmm. so you, then the second game can come out and people would want to buy it, then that would be more of an ethical way to do it. If you like, we have to keep the servers on, okay, well, there's a sub and that's it. And everything else, I paid $60 for the game. Uh, maybe now I'll just do a sub just to keep it live, right? And that's it. And that would be more ethical, I believe. Um And until the laws catch up, which they do need to, um, because like I said, you know, I have my kids now growing up and they're playing these games and that's all or all of those, you know, monetizations are built in there. And they my kid has no idea. He thinks that's how the games are built and they're made. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. no, and that's no, let's go play something better. And. And and uh, we'll go play Cave Story or something. Come on, <laughs> and like um, because and, and that's the thing is now the, this generation that's growing up. I don't know what this the you know ten and under like that's it. That's all they know is how the how you know ads monetization banner pools um, and stuff like that. And and it's such a big deviation from what games truly are. 
Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they're 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 not they're not like casinos that we use to use uh, convince kids to steal their mother's credit cards. Um, you know, it's like there's there art and experiences that we're supposed to enjoy, and so it's really perverting them when it, they're functioning this way mm-hmm. to keep them say they're keeping themselves afloat. And then, of course, everybody's mind is being changed to believe that that is the way that games are. And that's not the way it should be, Josh. Mm-hmm. And like you said, like, there's way too many games or too many people who view this as the norm. That the game doesn't come with, you know, additional content. That if it's not selling cosmetics or you can't just spend five dollars and skip 10 15 levels that's not a game worth playing and i think to that point i think this will be i think my final point and then uh i'll throw over to you that over this year another thing that i've seen is that there's still indie developers who i feel like they're still not trying to grow the genres that they're in i've played a lot of games that are just okay that even if you do a ton of work onto your art, even if you do a ton of marketing, that it still feels like there are some genres or some developers who are still kind of spinning their wheels. And I think another thing that we've seen in terms of 2022 is that people want, I guess, a new idea. They yep. want something that is packaged differently. They don't want to play the umpteenth uh, turn-based RPG that just looks like every other GRPG that came out. Just like they don't want to play your 50th version of Super Meat Boy. One of my favorite games that I talked about on the platforming list was Spark the Electric Jester 3, which is just an homage to Sonic Adventure. But even as I was playing them, I'm like, okay, it's a great, you know, love letter to that game. Am I seeing anything new? Am I seeing any issues with the design that have been fixed? Or a new way of kind of showing this off and the answer was like no like it's good but it doesn't feel like it's doing anything beyond kind of what that genre is and i think i mentioned this with um what was the other game that i play i think could have been asked the libra that it's a game that was designed by the fans by someone who's like obviously a super hardcore fan could be another game that i'm thinking of But the idea that all the good and all the bad must be treated as, you know, set in stone. That we cannot change an element in a game that was inspired by a Sonic or inspired by Doom. We must do everything the exact same way or, you know, we're betraying the design. Right. Like, two fantastic shooters I played this year, Ultra Kill and Coltic. They both have very obvious inspirations that are, their games are coming from. But the developers are still doing something different. They're still trying to push it into a different way. So that it doesn't just feel like, oh, this is the 15th version of Doom Eternal. Or this is the 8th version of Blood. But it still feels like a lot of developers that once they kind of set on a formula or use someone else's formula, they're not thinking you know, step two or step three. And this is something we talked about on a previous cast. Yep. Being inspired by a game or making your version of Mario or your version of Doom or Elden Ring, that's not the end goal. That's step two or three. Then you have to make it your own. Exactly. And so there's like, there's a, there's a few points here. Like for one, I'm going to like talk about technically why, uh, why that would happen is like, okay, so, Let's just say I'm going to make like a Sonic game, right? Mm-hmm. And so I'm going to start doing it. All the things I was talking about, I was talking about earlier about the barrel explosion. Well, first I'm going to figure out, okay, the character controller. How is he going to move? He has to move like Sonic. So I'm going to spend all my time figuring out the physics formula, uh, how it's going to mm-hmm. work, how he's going to move. When I get all that working and then I get all the art working and then I get everything done, I don't know what time frame we're looking at. I don't know how long the game took, but we're already invested in a ton of time. <laughs> And so now that I have it working, it's like, okay, where, where can I push the boundaries without breaking the game, yeah. right? 
And so that's the hard part. So that's usually where people get genre stuck. So like those things have to be thought about beforehand, right? So like while you're designing it, um, you have to do like what extra, what, um, because the, the formula is already there, right? Sonic's yeah. already made. So that step's done for you, right? It's like, what are you going to add on to it? How can you expand? And that's the biggest advantage that we have of indies. And that's why people love to come to the spaces because we can push the boundaries and do all kind of really cool, neat things. We're not beholden to giant corporations. We can, we're very nimble, very agile. We can switch things up. And so, like, again, when you're taking inspiration from something, you know, study it, break it down, all that good stuff. What makes it work? What doesn't make it tick? And then that's just the first step and you go from there and expand on it, right? Okay, how, what, mm -hmm. what can I add to this to make it different, to make it stand out? Because again, people are clamoring for new and exciting experiences. Again, mm -hmm. I, I personally don't have time to play another Doom clone, right? I, I, I don't. Like, I, if I'm going to play something, it has to be something very unique and something, a, a, a new experience for me because... Mm -hmm. um, my gaming time is limited as a game developer. I wish I, I could mm -hmm. game more, but it, but it's limited because I'm developing a game, uh, developing games. So I don't have the time to um, to always play as many as I wish. And so when I do play, it's always like going to be a unique experience or something new, or just you know, of course, like an Elden Ring or something where where you just have to you know, a giant mass one where you have to see. But I'm oh, but you know, always want the ones I really want to play are the new and interesting experiences that offer something different. Yep. And that's, and that's one of the key quote, you know, one of the key things to keep in mind is like, is bring something new and innovative to the table. And it's hard to do. Um, but that's what you need. That's what you got to focus on. Right. You know what I mean? Getting, uh, starting with your steps, you know, what's my influence and then where can I take it? Where, where can I, where would I want to go with this? Or where can I envision this going, and where could it have been, and where could it be, um, basically? Mm hmm And it's going to be that question that's going to have to get more answers to in 2023. Three. That's right. Because how many Vampire Survivor Lake clones are we going to get in the next 12 months? I um, can't wait. I can't wait, Josh. <laughs> mm-hmm. How many of them am I going to end up getting uh, demos and keys for that I'll play on stream for everyone to enjoy? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> There's going to be, there'll be AI, AI art generated deck builders <laughs> uh, for sure. Um and there's going to be open. Uh, there's going to be a ton of open world games coming out next year because of uh, UE5 also. So and don't that forget is... Elden Ring, of course. And Elden Ring. So because uh, Elden Ring, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are we going to say anything about Elden Ring or? Oh uh, well, we are going to do games of the year for it next yeah, year. So yeah, we'll wait for that. Yeah, we can certainly. Uh, we'll have a lot of time for that for then. Um. Any other trends that you want to discuss let's or see here. um let's see here. We basically covered I think I, I covered all the trends uh basically already. Um very interesting year. Time does not exist anymore. Um any other standouts for you this year, Josh? And I'm trying to remember so much stuff happened this year. I'm mm. trying to to see what else. Um what other trends Mm -hmm. uh capitalism won again mm -hmm. um but um vampire survivors proved that it, uh core gameplay can be just as much as a juggernaut against uh uh triple a marketing and stuff like that uh, except if you're going to the game awards um other than that josh i think that about covers it yeah i guess the only other things would be again we're seeing more talks about unions which is always great for game yes. developers yes Yes. And again, the success of Dwarf Fortress. And I'm, again, like, so it's going to be very interesting to see how, like, mainstream or, you know, regular consumers, if they ever get their hands yeah. on Dwarf Fortress, what they will think of that one. But if they think Elden Ring is aimless, no, like, Elden Ring is like paint by numbers, like kindergarten right. compared to something like Dwarf Fortress or when I played Fear and Hunger 2 on stream. 
You don't know what failure is until you play Fear and Hunger, where in the tutorial you can get your legs chopped off if you fail the tutorial. See, that's hardcore. That's hardcore. <laughs> but I format your hard drive. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that that's the uh, hardcore. Uh, that's hardcore video game playing, not the same as hardcore game dev. That's right. That's right. <laughs> But I think with that, we will wrap things up. We have some multiplayer planned for tonight. We'll see who is available. If Josh, if I'm you are... My best. Yes, yeah. I'm going to try my best to make it. We may uh, do some fighting game. games. If not, we of course have Deep Rock and so on to play. I will probably be doing a Sunday night stream. I don't know what yet. I still have to do some more RPG research. So it may just be a very role-playing night. But we will be back next Saturday, just in time for the end of the year, for our Games of 2022. I will still probably be doing my daily uh, award category episodes by then as well. But I hope everyone is going to have a great holiday. Have your festive uh, headgear as well all set up. It has dropped down to 15 degrees, so I've lost a degree over here since we started. But everyone, stay warm and stay safe for the holidays. Right, thank you, and uh, be sure and uh, join Josh's Discord, buy some books, uh, mm -hmm. follow me on Twitter, um, and uh, Wishlist Samurai Pig, Rooster Rampage. Also, doing consulting now if you're working on an Unreal Engine 5 game and you need a little help, uh, hit me up and I might be able to help you. And Josh, mm -hmm. do the liking, subscribing, commenting, all that great stuff. And we will be back next Saturday around 5 p.m. ET or the games of 2022 list so everyone once again have a great night great holiday and come back for the discussions on game design here and on game wisdom where we examine the art and science of games until next time everybody take care